So today I'm really excited and uh, honored to, to, to introduce our, our guest, Adrian Lozano Duran. Uh, he's an assistant professor at MIT Aerostro. It's a very quite brief introduction um, to, to, to our guest. So he received his PhD in aerospace engineering uh, at the University of Madrid. And he also has been a postdoctoral researcher uh, at the Center of Turbulence Research at Stanford University, so quite prestigious uh, center. Uh, he he had more than, more than 50 published contribution in prestigious journals. So this is a very, very brief introduction. Uh, he worked with uh, a pioneering professor like uh, Professor Jimenez and Barbitz Moyne. Um, and his research so uh, has so many topics, uh, specifically he worked on uh, um, world boundary turbulence. So uh, uh, several works were, uh, were on that and also on computational fluid mechanics, uh, turbulence theory, as well as uh, high speed flows, uh, multi-phase flows uh, among others. Uh, among other topics, I'll say he, he, our uh, Adrian Lozano Duran uh, worked also on artificial intelligence modeling, which will be the, the topic of uh, today's talk. So oh, I don't want to, to take any, any further time. Uh, I would just like to say that the talk is going to be recorded. So if uh, you switch off your microphone, uh, we'll have time question at the end of the talk. Uh, and at the time you can switch on your microphone and ask your question or simply write uh, your question to the chat. So that's it. Um, Adrian, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, Thank you everyone for joining the talk. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, uh, let me start first a bit about some background of type of problems I'm interested in. Uh, and then I'll, I'll try to focus more on the, what they wanna, wanna talk about. I'm mostly uh, interested in the in physics of um, turbulent flows, fluid mechanics, but in particular turbulent flows. Uh, in the fundamentals, understanding the physics of that, and then also the applications, I, I try to bridge both of them as much as I can. What I show here is the kind of the different regimes that I'm interested in from uh, UAVs, commercial aircraft, and then high speed aerodynamics. So it's increasing the, the speed of the flow from left to right. But all these cases, they have something in common and what they, they, what they have in common from the aerodynamic point of view. And that is a challenge that goes across all these cases, is that they involve uh, systems that are highly turbulent and many, many degrees of freedom. So I try to tackle this using theory and numerical simulation. The first question is, why do I want to do high fidelity simulations? And what are the challenges actually of doing that? And answer to that is that if we really want to have some transformative designs for these uh, three cases that you see here, so many times the experiments are almost impossible or very costly uh, to, to perform, uh, while in that case, uh, computational simulations can enable to have uh, some testing that would be very difficult in terms of uh, economical cost and the turnaround in time. And the challenge comes in that case is that these are very high dimensional systems. There is a lot of scale separation between the smallest scales involved in the flow to the largest one could be a factor of thousand or even more. And the degrees of freedom are usually very high, nine, 10 to the nine, 10 to the 14. Uh, so the question is how can we uh, leverage the, what we know about the physics to actually have an impact on these type of cases. And the, the problem I'm gonna talk about today, it is related to the uh, commercial aircraft airliner. Um, and the prediction of aerodynamic forces uh, on this case. The motivation for that and is kind of expanding on what I mentioned before. If you think of the development of a commercial aircraft, uh, usually it's kind of very, very demanding uh, task. Could be of the order of 10 billion. Obviously this doesn't account just for the aerodynamics. This is uh, the big number that take into account many things of integrating everything together from materials, electronics, aerodynamics. But the part that I am interested in that is related to aerodynamics is the fact that many qualities of the aircraft uh, uh, and by quality, I mean, for example, the, the lift coefficient or any aerodynamic quality of the aircraft. Most of them are demonstrated using a flight test. A flight test could be a wind tunnel experiment, 
or could be uh, directly building the aircraft and testing if everything works. Uh, you have this chart on the right that is just qualitative uh, that shows that most of the demonstration of a quality of an aircraft that those are going to be used for certifications and that are done in the flight test. There is a small portion of the simulations. So this idea is to move to in the short term, kind of mid short term, move to something more like what you see in the chart at the at the, uh, the bottom right. Maybe have uh, half half of the uh, demonstration of the qualities using simulations, and the other half using flight tests. This is usually referred as certification by analysis. Uh, that is just a way of saying I want to use a simulation. Simulation that is uh, the cost is going to be much smaller, the monetary cost, and also the time around. So I can just use a one day or two days to get some prediction that the, it has a high quality prediction and then I can iterate faster. So this is supposed to reduce the cost of designing uh, new aircraft. So that uh, uh, I mentioned the prediction. So that means that if we want to actually be, this be a reality, we are going to need to push the tolerance of the models that we have to very low numbers. So it will depend exactly on what's the quantity of interest, but let's say that we want things that are of the order of a few percentage, one, three percent error. Uh, this is touching with this idea of somehow uh, replacing the, the flight test of the wind tunnel experiment with uh, a simulations. Uh, what you see here uh, on, the, on the left is an actual experiment. So this is an experiment on a wind tunnel. Then the, the model is painted with a, some reflective oil, and this is used to visualize the pattern on the aircraft. So what you see here is half the aircraft. And what you see on the right is a simulation. Uh, I'll talk more about that later. Is the visualization of uh, forces at the wall of the aircraft. Uh, and it's exactly the same experiment. So you see, this is the idea is that we want to go to the right. And I can do this in one day, make my predictions. And hopefully with time, my predictions are going to be so reliable that I don't I never need to go back to the experiment in the wind tunnel. So I will know that what I get is what, what I should get. Uh, so the, for this case, and uh, I'm going to talk uh, for this talk about the leaf prediction of a commercial aircraft, probably because it's the, the, uh, one of the most important qualities that we, we want to know, uh, in particular in the, in the landing. And I'll mention exactly what I want, uh, what I want to predict that and why, why that's a challenge. Uh, you are all familiar with the lift. So the lift is just the, the force that is keeping the aircraft uh, flying, the, the vertical force. So if you get an aircraft that is flying with some velocity u, we know that the lift is proportional to some coefficient to the square of the velocity. The CL is going to be the main quantity of interest in this talk, uh, the, the one that I want to predict. But you see on the right this uh, plot that is actually the only plot that I'm going to discuss in, in, in in this talk is the only plot that you need to understand. I'm showing the angle of attack of the aircraft. So this is in degrees. The vertical axis is the lift. The experiment, so this uh, plot contains experiments. There are these uh, symbols. And then you see in red a uh, scatter uh, values all around. Uh, these are different tools, different numerical methods to make the prediction of the lift. This was done in, recently in the 2018 uh, prediction workshop for the high lift, you see that there is this scatter, like depending on the method that you use, sometimes predictions are not very reliable. Sometimes you can over predict or under predict. And that's particularly true at this point where you see the maximum of the CL. This is for landing configuration. And uh, interestingly, that's the point that we want to predict with the highest accuracy. It's very important to know what is the maximum lift of an aircraft. Uh, when it's in landing configuration, because we really don't, don't want to increase the angle of attack above that. Otherwise, the aircraft is going to stall. Uh, so we want to have a very accurate prediction of that. The reason why this is so scattered is because the dynamics of the flow at that point are very unsteady. There are very strong separation. So we have a turbulent flows with very strong unsteadiness and a highly, uh, massively separated flow. That's what is making this a challenge. So the goal here is to improve this prediction uh, and also doing it with uh, some computational cost that is reasonable. Uh, you can always add a lot of points to the simulation and that will try uh, tend to improve at least the solution, but the idea is to avoid that as much as possible. So let's now uh, explain a bit why this is happening. And then and now it's gonna come into play a turbulent flow. That's why I'm calling this the anatomy of a turbulent bond layer over an aircraft. 
So for those of you that maybe are not so familiar with this. So when the aircraft is flying essentially far away from the aircraft, you have a flow that is kind of quasi-laminar. So there are perturbations and those are usually the small perturbations, especially when the aircraft is flying fast. The perturbations in the atmosphere, they could be kind of small. So we have some laminar flow that is smooth. That's what I'm sketching here. And then very fast over the, the, the airfoil when the flow comes in, it's going to transition and become turbulent. And this is what I'm representing here is these eddies of different sizes, different scales. And this turbulent flow over the airfoil, that is actually over all the aircraft, is important uh, in the sense that it's going to be uh, 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 fundamental for predicting what are the forces. So I'm just showing here just an illustration. Uh, this is just a simulation of an, an airfoil. So you get a feeling of how the flow would look like. This is an airfoil. That is, uh, the, there is the flow coming in. So what you see here is the visualization of the velocity. Light is low velocity, uh, sorry, dark is low velocity and light is high velocity. So you get a, an idea of that, I'll play that again. So you see that we have these turbulent boundary layers that they, they grow and then they, they detach to form a, a wake at the, at the end. Uh, so why is this important? This is important because the lift, the drag, the moments over the aircraft, all these, they are going to depend strongly of, on this uh, turbulent boundary layer. So we really need to make a reasonable prediction, uh, especially if we are talking here about errors that we are looking for of the order of 3% error or 5% below that. So we really need to capture this effect of the turbulent boundary layer. Uh, if we zoom in a little more, because now if this is, if we now agree that we have to predict this uh, boundary layer and we need to capture the, the scales in space and time, uh, we, we can discuss a, a little bit more about what are the physics of that. Let's now zoom in here. So this is a very small portion of the over the wing of the aircraft. And now I'm representing these different eddies here again. The boundary layer thickness, the turbulent boundary layer is usually a thickness delta. And then that's the kind of representation of the, the some large scale of the boundary layer. And then we, we know that turbulence is multi-scale. So we are going to have then a smallest eddy, that the possible eddy, that's what is, would be represented in this sketch by the smallest eddies that you see here. Those are denoted with this um, scale eta. And just a rough estimation. So we can use the density viscosity of the flow, the velocity of the aircraft to make some estimations using what we know of how is the momentum transferred from the wall uh, out to, to, the, to the far field to make a prediction of the, this delta and the eta. Delta usually in an aircraft could be between one and 10 millimeters. So you see these boundary layers are actually very thin. And the eta, the, the smallest scale that we can have, those uh, are uh, defined by the dissipation that we have in the system, also the viscosity and density of the system. This could be order of a few, a few microns. And you see that now the scale separation that we have is of the order of 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. Uh, so that's in a way setting the challenge here. We have just in the vertical direction of the aircraft, we have a scale separation that goes from 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. Now we need to account for the fact that then we have this thin boundary layer everywhere over the aircraft, extended over all the area of the aircraft. And that's going to complicate the problem even more in terms of degrees of freedom. Uh, so what we do to solve this computationally, conceptually, what we should do is to generate a grid. That's what I'm trying to uh, convey with this sketch. Obviously, the, this is a sketch. The grid should be very fine, and we should capture all the smallest eddies that we have. That's the typical approach if we want to solve the navier stokes equations in this problem. And using these scales and the area of the aircraft, I can make an estimation of how many points I need. Uh, this is a, an illustration of how a grid would look like this is a grid generated using a Voronoi diagram, but you get the idea. So if I, this is a small region here, I zoom, I zoom in, then I will see something like the, the grid like that. And again, this grid is very coarse also. Uh, if I use the actual grid that I will need to solve all these scales, it would be so fine that you would be able to see nothing. So I know that I need to solve the Navier-Stokes equation. So that, that's known. These equations are going to be accurate as long as I'm able to have a grid that is fine enough to solve the scale eta. Um, I can make some estimations, the number of points that I need just to solve the turbulent boundary layers over the aircraft. So the number of points that I need to solve that is just an integral of the density of points that I need. The density of points, I will go the integral from, the, from zero is the wall of the aircraft to the thickness of the boundary layer. And then I integrate that over, the, over all the surface. And the density of points 
that I need, it, it goes with the cube of this eta scale. So these are the, this is the smallest scale that I have. And because this is a grid in 3D, then it goes as the cube. And you get that what you need is something like 10 to the uh, 16 degrees of freedom, uh, more or less that's an estimation. That means that each flow field is 300 petabytes. And that means if I use the largest uh, supercomputer that we have right now, it will take, I say here this number, it's actually a ridiculous number, it's like 100 millennia. The, the message here is that it's actually impossible. It does, the, first, the problem doesn't fit in any computer. And also if you try to fit this problem in a computer, it'll take forever. So this means that we have to really drop this. We, we, there is no hope. We can solve the Navier-Stokes equations to compute an aircraft solving all the small, all the scales, all the range of scales from the largest to the, the smallest scale. So let's think of this problem in the other way around. So the other way to think about this is like, what is the grid that I can afford? So now I change the problem. Now I say, okay, imagine that this is a grid that I can afford. I can make the numbers. I can say, okay, I could get maybe 10 to the eight degrees of freedom, like hundred million. So hundred million degrees of freedom. If I use a supercomputer, that's okay. I can solve that in maybe one day. So then I, I work with this backwards. So I, then I know that I know this point, so I can get this eta. Then that means that maybe my, my grid size could be of the order of one millimeter. That means that my, my flow field, every time that I, I save a snapshot, is going to be 10 gigabytes. That's quite reasonable. And this is going to take one day using 2,000 cores, using just a regular HPC computer. So uh, this is actually something possible. Now, what is the catch here? Uh, the catch is that I told you before that this eta is of the order of microns, and now my grid is of the order of millimeters. Uh, so there are some of these small scale motions in the flow that I cannot solve. My grid is not able to capture them. They, they are just a sub grid. Uh, they are below my grid. And that has some consequences. It has some consequences far away from the wall, obviously. So the dynamics of what the turbulent flow uh, are gonna be very different or potentially could be very different far away. And for this talk, in particular, what I mentioned is that they want to predict the forces at the wall because that's what it's going to give me the lift. And because I'm missing these eddies everywhere, then the forces at the wall uh, are going to be incorrectly predicted. If I just take this grid, I solve Navier-Stokes equations in the grid, discretizing without doing anything else, I'm not going to get the correct prediction. That's because I'm missing those small eddies. And I'm missing the small eddies everywhere, far away and close from the wall. The, the momentum is transferred both ways. So there is a transfer of momentum from the wall up and uh, far away to the wall. So even if I'm resolving things that are not correct far away from the wall, that will also propagate to the wall. Uh, and the takeaway is that I need to compensate uh, for these eddies that I'm missing. And that's where the modeling part comes into play. So I need an, uh, this model to account for these eddies that are smaller to the grid. There are different ways of doing that. The approach that I'm gonna follow is called wall model LES. It's called wall model because essentially I, we are looking at a region that is very close to, to, the, to a wall and we are going to model that. And it's called large eddy simulation because we are only going to resolve only large eddies and the small, one, the small ones are, are lost. Uh, but before moving that, I want to acknowledge that there are other methods actually to do this. Uh, usually there is grants, there is like hybrid grants with DES. Uh, th those, those are also valid methods. It's just that I'm going to focus in this wall model LES. So how does this, does this work? So far away from the wall, I'm going to get some information at a given distance h. That information is the state of the flow, it's the density, velocity, temperature, and pressure. And I'm going to have a model. That model is going to use that information to make a prediction of the forces at the wall. And uh, denoting that by a tau wall. And then that those forces that are predicted at the wall, they are imposed as a boundary condition to the LES. So in the wall model LES, the concept is that we replace the non-slip condition at the wall. That's what you would do usually, but we replace that by a, a stress condition. I impose a force at the wall. And the way this is done is using this scheme, getting information far away, predicting what should be the forces and applying that. So everything is coupled. So how is this done uh, uh, right now? Uh, there are different ways of doing this. Uh, usually the we use some simplified version of the Navier-Stokes equations in this model, just neglecting many terms, and that's a simplified version that could get some prediction, and then that prediction is, is going to be used to be imposed at the wall. Uh, the approach I'm going to follow here is going to be slightly different in the sense that I'm going to replace this instead of using some algebraic equation, I'll use some 
a machine version, a machine learning version of that. So how I'm going to do that? So let's take a look at what is the model that comes here. Uh, this is actually the most important part of the talk and the most important part of the model because this is the main assumption of the, of the model. So the model I'm calling it like self-critical model to compute all forces. I'll clarify why, what, what I call it self-critical. Uh, so the, the main assumption here is that even if you have an airflow that is very complex, very complicated motion, as the one that you can encounter in external aerodynamics, especially when you have high lift separation. Even if you have that, uh, the idea here is that there is a finite set of building blocks, very simple cases of flow that they contain the essential physics that we need. And that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna select for this case, three building blocks. And those are the three that you see here is going to be the wall, a turbulent flow in a, between two flat plates. This is usually referred to as a turbulent channel flow. I'm going to use a flow that is separations. This is a flow that is going over a flat plate, and there is some pressure gradient on the top, so the flow is uh, changing direction. It generates some separation, and then it reattaches again and continues. So this building block is going to capture the essence of the physics about separation. And the last case is a juncture flow or a corner flow is the flow that you get when you have a corner here. So this is going to be done using a simulation like that. So one advantage of using these three building blocks is that first, I can understand the physics of these cases much easily than the physics on a full aircraft because so much, so many things going on there. But these are very clean cases where I can isolate the physics and understand what is happening. The second thing is like, because these are building blocks that are very contained, I can also have very high fidelity simulation. I can really resolve all the scales of the flow motion in these three blocks. Uh, and that's gonna give me a lot of data that then I can use later. That's something that I wouldn't be able to do in the aircraft. So the next step is that, I think that I described some of this. So what are the, the steps for the building this model? The first one is select three representative building blocks. So representative of the case uh, that I'm going to solve, I'm thinking that the case that I'm going to I'm going to work on right now, that is uh, the, the the aircraft. Uh, these three building blocks they contain the essential physics. Uh, if for some reason I apply the model that I'm going to show you to a case where it's very far away from the physics of these building blocks, obviously that's not going to hold. Uh, the second step is actually now as important as the first one, now that when that I decide that these building blocks are the important ones, I need to understand and identify what are the important scales of the problem, the length, velocity, and time scales. Uh, I think that people that work on fluid dynamics, they are aware that this is actually the most important thing to understand a problem. What are the scales involved in the problem? In the case of a turbulent flow, it's usually multi-scale, so that makes things slightly more difficult. So for each building block, I want to understand what is the important length scale, the velocity scale, and the time scales of the problem involved. And in general, in the case of a channel flow, uh, you can show that the distance to the wall is the current length scale, then the momentum transfer is the current velocity scale, and then you can combine that to get a time scale. In the case of the separation, it's different. Uh, the way you get the important time scales is by uh, reasoning about what are the important terms in the Navier-Stokes equations. The Navier-Stokes equations, you have different terms that they have to balance. So the question is, which terms are balancing when I have a flow like this? In the case of the separation, what really matters close to the separation is the pressure gradient that has to be balanced by some viscous forces. In the case of the channel, it was different. It was inertial forces what you have. So that will give me, again, some length scale, some velocity scale, and some time scale. Uh, and that's going to be important because then it means that I know uh, I have a reference of, of, of how uh, this separation is controlled. And in the case of a corner flow, it's trying, kind of similar to a, a channel flow, but it's slightly different because of the effect of the corner. You will have some velocity scale that is now controlled by the production of uh, kinetic energy that you have close to the corner. And it's also controlled by a two-dimensional shear. So a mean shear, that's what is this TS here. And using that, you can again deduce a length scale. So the main message here uh, is that I, although I'm not entering in describing the physics of these three building blocks, uh, it is important to understand the physics and to de derive these length scales. And the third step is to have uh, a neural network, for example, uh, to do two things that I want to do. I want to classify the flow and I want to make a, that prediction 
of the forces at the wall, ones that I know what type of flow I have. And the last step that I want to do is as important as the previous one, is I want to obtain a confidence in the prediction, uh, because I think that models, usually they don't tend to do this, but it's actually very relevant. So now we are, now that we know the basis for what the model is gonna do, and we are, it's clear that we are gonna use these building blocks and we know the scales, I'm gonna describe a bit more uh, how I'm gonna do the, the classification of the flow and then the, the prediction of the stress at the wall and how I get the confidence. What I wanted to show here is just a, an example of some the, the data that I use. So this is a simulation of a channel flow. What you see here is the, uh, the entropy or if you want the dissipation, the magnitude of the dissipation in the, in the channel flow. Uh, so it's just a cut in this plane, this red plane that you see. So I, we can really get a very high fidelity data in this case and look into a lot of detail of what are the physics of the flow. So for Reynolds numbers that are uh, still not the, as high as the one in external aerodynamics, but they are still reasonable. So now how is the model gonna work? So as any model, what we need to define are some inputs for the model. Uh, imagine that I get a point over the surface of the aircraft. And this operation that I'm gonna describe here is gonna be applied to all the points in the surface where I have a grid point. So if I, I zoom in there and you see this uh, inset of the wall, I'm gonna have some stencil. This is the stencil that I have here with this different point, seven points. Uh, so it's an stencil that is uh, designed to capture some three-dimensional effects if those happen in the flow. And again, what we can do, the inputs, the, the, there is some requirements. And one requirement for the input is that they should be non-dimensional. The model doesn't care about the units of whatever flow it is or the viscosity. It only cares about non-dimensional numbers. And considering that I'm going to use the information of the flow at those points and information of, of the flow is usually velocity, some differences of velocities, and the derivative of those velocities and the properties of the flow density viscosity and the properties of the grid, like the size of the grid, you can build many different non-dimensional groups. So the input to the model is all the non-dimensional groups that I can form using the input parameters of the model. So that's what I'm representing here. The model will know that you have some velocity infinity. And when you see this UK here, sub K, or this L sub K, these are the length scales that I can form for the different building blocks. So I have, I, uh, the model gets the information at these points. With those points, I build the characteristic scales that I defined before. And with that, I form all the non-dimensional groups that I can. Uh, and that's gonna be helpful because now those non-dimensional groups and each of them is non-dimensionalized using the characteristic scales of different type of building blocks. Those are gonna allow me to identify what type of flow I have. So the next step, once that I have that information, is to fit that to this scheme uh, is divided into two parts. It's a predictor and a classifier. Uh, the first thing is the, the classifier. So what the classifier is doing is it gets these non-dimensional numbers, and it tries to make a prediction of what type of flow you have. So the output of this classifier is, do I have a, this given percentage of flat play flow, the juncture or separated flow? If you have a flow that is completely separated, then you will get that essentially you have a 90% separated flow. Or if you have a flow that looks a lot like a channel flow, then you will get that if your flow is essentially a flat plate flow to do that. Uh, and this information on the, on the type of the flow that you have is also fed to the predictor. So the predictor is also gonna use the input, this non-dimensional input, and also the type of flow that you have uh, like the mixture, again, this doesn't need to be one particular type, could be like a combination of different type of flows, could be 50% flat plate, 50% separation. And he's gonna use that information to use this prediction, the tau wall that is the stress at the wall that he want to. The last step uh, or the last output is the confidence that I put this in, in red. So uh, the, the, the classifier is gonna try to predict, does the flow look like, it, does it look like a separated flow or a junction flow or a flat plate, it might be that it doesn't look like any of them. And in that case, the classifier would say, well, actually, I don't know what is this flow. And that is going to be used to make a confidence. 
So this will make a prediction. It will tell me what type of flow it is, and it will give a confidence. If the, if the flow that the model sees, it can be explained by a combination of these building blocks, then the model is gonna say that it has a lot of confidence that that, that, that prediction that you're getting is meaningful. If then the flow doesn't look at all like one of those building blocks, it could give then a confidence. It, it will still make a prediction. It will make a prediction of the stress. It will tell me, I think that this looks more like a flat plate or whatever the case is, but the confidence is gonna be very low. And that's a warning saying that you're applying the model in a region of the flow where actually you shouldn't believe what the prediction is. So that's what's also gonna be uh, as important as the prediction itself, because it helps you to uh, understand the regions of the flow where you don't know what is happening. Um, so that's kind of uh, the main structured architecture. I didn't, uh, uh, you, here you have the information about how the net networks are done. This is a deep forward neural network, different layers and neurons. The classifier is a Bayesian neural network because it gives some probabilities of things happening, the type of flow being one or the other. I didn't emphasize that because probably it's not like I optimize for this architecture. And also I didn't emphasize much that this is a neural network because actually I don't even need a neural network to do this. I, I, I could use a classifier, I could do some clustering method and the clustering method will tell me what type of flow. And for the prediction, I could use an analytical model. I could switch between one another. So it's true that I'm using a neural network to, to make the prediction because it's convenient. Neural networks are very good at classifying and neural networks are very good at making these nonlinear predictions, com combining in a nonlinear way different cases. So it's convenient. But conceptually, I don't need that, even a neural network. Uh, so, and, and that's why it probably works, because things work when you don't need a particular tool to be attached to it. So it's very clear what the model is doing, even if I'm using this neural network. So how I train the model. So I use this building block. I have a, a data set, actually very large. It's of the order of 500 terabytes. This is a collection of direct numerical simulations solving all the scales of these different building blocks, for changing different parameters. So these simulations themselves, they have their own non-dimensional numbers like a Reynolds number or the separation strength, like non-dimensional pressure gradient. Uh, I have a collection of those and all those I use to train the neural network. I'm not gonna enter much into the, the data science part of that, but it's actually very challenging because just ingesting these 500 terabytes through the network, it takes a lot of time. Just reading the data, even if you do nothing with it, just going through the data and reading it, it takes a lot, a lot of time. And that implies that you have to really plan very well of how you're gonna train this. Uh, so it's uh, uh, actually an extra challenge. It's very interesting, the, the methods and the way of doing that, but I'm not gonna focus so much here. I wanted to focus more on the part of the related to the, to the physics. So with that, I take these building blocks and I go through this and I train the network and then I validate uh, that is able to predict these building blocks almost by definition because it was trained for these cases. So it has to predict them well. Uh, and I see that the classification is correct and the confidence is correct. And then I take this and I apply it to uh, the case that I'm interested in. That is this one. Uh, this is the experiment I'm gonna compare with. This is the high lift common research model uh, uh, this is an experiment in the wind tunnel. Uh, they, they have half the angle of attack. Uh, sorry, they have half the aircraft. The reason for that is just to fit a larger model in the wind tunnels. You can increase the Reynolds number. And then the angle of attack is high, 20 degrees, because we want to look at the region with we have high lift, although we have all their angle of all their angles of attack that I'll show. The Mach number is low, it is essentially an incompressible flow. And that's why my building blocks were essentially incompressible, all of them. Reynolds number is high, is, uh, 10 to the 10 to the 6 is high, but it's still one order of magnitude below what you would get in an actual aircraft. So this is because it's the wind tunnel experiment and you get 10 to the 6 in a real aircraft, you will get a Reynolds number that is 10 to the 7. Uh, for example, the uh, a Boeing 737, something like that. Um, this is also a, a visualization from the uh, from the experiment. I, I mentioned this in the introduction. What they do is they paint with some fluorescent oil the surface of the aircraft. They, they run that in the wind tunnel and they use the light uh, to visualize the, this pattern. It's kind of an average pattern of the aircraft, of what the, the, the footprint of what the turbulent flow is doing. And this is just uh, qualitative, but it can be used to compare with the simulation to see if you can get some important features, uh, at least point-wise, of the flow. 
So now this is now my real setup. Uh, this is the now the 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 cut of the of the aircraft. This is a summary of the type of simulation I'm going to do. I'm within the framework of wall model LES, and I have this circuit scale model. For the wall model, I'm going to use the model that I just introduced, the self critical model. And now you see that self critical means in this case that is able to provide some confidence in the prediction. So it's going to criticize itself in a way like, oh, this prediction I don't think is good. So you should know. Then the resolution that we use in this type of simulations, if I divide my grid compared to the boundary layer, is going to be of the order of five, uh, 20 points. So this is of the order of 100 million grid points. If you remember, that's what I mentioned. Those are the grids that I can afford. The solver is a standard solver. It's a finite volume uh, second order solver. This is jointly developed by uh, Stanford and Cascade. And I, here at MIT, I take care also of developing uh, the modeling part, like for example, this one. Uh, what is good about this code is that the, the grid in a strategy follows a Voronoi uh, uh, scheme that is actually very convenient. And typical integration in time. And for you to have a reference, these simulations that I'm going to show, they took, they took two days using 2000 processors. Uh, I think that this is actually a video. So this is the transient, like initializing the simulation. So you can see that the transient, how the flow is going to transition over the wind. Uh, so a few features here that you can see, you can see that the, you have the nacelle for the engine and that's generated some separation and that has a, a impinging on the, on the wind and that's when I generate this pattern here. Then you see the, for the slat, there is some structure connecting the slat to the wind and those are also, uh, you can see the wake from those. And at the wind tip, uh, you can see if you pay attention that the flow tends to go in the opposite direction a bit. Uh, that's because there is a strong separation there in the in the wind tip. So all these features, in a way, uh, they have to be realistic and they have to be captured in a in a realistic manner. If I want to make a good predictions of the of the lift and and also of the of the drag, and also this is giving you a sense of the type of uh, scales that we are solving. So as I said before, this is of the area of millimeters. Um, I have this other visualization. I want to uh, acknowledge also Conrad Gott from Stanford that he generated the video. Uh, this is also to give you a feeling of the type of scales that we are solving in this simulation uh, or order of millimeters again. Uh, and I'm going to emphasize that it looks like these actually are very fine details of the flow, but this is so far away from the smallest scales. So the, the smallest scale that we can have here is uh, 10,000 times smaller. Those we are missing and we don't see. So that's why actually this problem is so challenging. But we are able to solve all this level of detail over, over the wind. Um, so now let's look at the, uh, the, the predictions. Um, and uh, for, for these predictions, I'm also using as a control test uh, a traditional model. I'll uh, explain a bit about that. So I'm, I'm uh, plotting here again the the only plot actually that I'm showing here, as I mentioned, is the lift as a function of the angle of attack. And you see here the, the experiment that is uh, in the cyan. Uh, the open symbol is a classic model. So the classic model is a model that is uh, currently used most of the time. Uh, is a model based on a simple uh, algebraic model that uh, use the law of the wall, is using the law of the wall to make a prediction. Uh, is probably the most widely used approach to make this type of predictions. And I ran also a case uh, just to compare of the, using the classic world model and the classic world model using exactly the same numerics, the same grid, the same grid scale models, exactly the same setup. The only thing that I change is the, uh, the type of model that is predicting the forces at the world. And then the close symbol is the model that I just introduced. And you can see in this case, how is the improvement of the model for this grid. Uh, I uh, By this point, actually, I have uh, more data points to show that this wasn't a coincidence. I just that I, I didn't have the time to put all together into this plot. Uh, but this happens at different angles of attack, even if I'm showing that here. So you see that uh, this uh, is definitely improving the prediction that we had before, before we have like maybe 10 or 20% errors. Now we can it's still not perfect, but we can move much closer. But what is even more interesting, and I want to emphasize that, is, uh, well, this is a video again. I think this is the same video as I've shown before. But what I wanted to uh, emphasize is this ability of the model to provide some confidence on the solution. 
And what I'm plotting here is over the wind. I can plot the regions where the confidence of the model is below some threshold. For example, regions where the confidence of the model is below 50%. And we can also try to make sense of this. Uh, so you see that in the leading edge, in the leading edge of the wind, uh, especially also the leading edge of the nacelle and the leading edge of the, of the flaps, we get these red regions. That means that the model is not confident enough. That in a way makes sense because in those regions, the one delay layers are very thin and our resolution is not able to actually solve those very thin bonded layers. The starting point of a bonded layer is almost zero thickness. So that means that my grid should go almost to zero at the leading edge, but obviously I cannot do that. So in a way, this makes sense that the, the model is unable to predict the, uh, accurately what is happening there. And, but now I know in a way that now I can come back to my model and see why this didn't work. There's another region here that is close to the, the fuselage. Uh, this is a, a region where you have some stone separation and also a corner flow and it's very unsteady. So it might be that this, in a way, the building blocks that I'm using, they were not able to capture exactly what, what is happening here. But again, uh, what, what I would remark here is not that the model is failing there, is that I know is uh, not giving me confidence in those regions. And now I can come back and think why the model didn't work there and try to fix that. Uh, I'm gonna show just a last example that is actually kind of silly, but just to illustrate this idea of the confidence in, uh, in, that the model can predict, I just took the same model and I, I took this CAD model. This is the Star Wars X-Wing fighter at Mach 20. That is uh, a, a case that doesn't make sense for my model. So this is a very high Mach number, highly compressible. Now the effect of the temperature is very important. It's very important. I, I never mentioned anything, sorry. I never mentioned anything about the thermal bonded layers being important. And that's gonna be important here. Uh, and then I, I just run the case and computed the, the confidence that is shown here. So, and then I plot the regions where the confidence of the model is below 10% and is essentially everywhere. Uh, so that's also an advantage because if I take my model and I do something stupid with my model, it's gonna become immediately obvious that, and, and this is a case, like my building blocks, they don't know about compressibility. They don't know about shock waves. They don't know about the effect of the, uh, the thermal bonded layers and that's showing up here. The model essentially cannot classify what type of flow. It's a way of saying, I have never seen this before. I'll give you a prediction, but it's up to you uh, to think what you want to do with that. Uh, so I think that I was also kind of happy to see that the model was not working <laughs> in, a, in a way. I was happy to see that the model doesn't work when it shouldn't. Uh, that I think that's also important. And with that, uh, I'll just go to the kind of mentioning a few outstanding issues. Uh, I mentioned about them uh, during the talk, uh, but they are not minor and they are very important. Uh, the first one is uh, these fundamental building blocks, like what are they identifying them and how many do I need? Do I need three? Do I need 20? Is that with, with 10 of them, I can already cover all the range for aerospace engineering applications that I want. Uh, and what are they? Uh, am I missing something? It's not a trivial question, actually. It's not a trivial answer. I chose three. They might not be the best. They are reasonable, but they might not be the best. Then there is also a problem of the, in the confidence of these models. That is the false positives. It could happen that the model is telling you, I don't work in a region, and actually it does. Uh, you can actually think of cases that you can fool the model. Uh, just if you just set up the case, very artificial case, but it might happen in reality. So it's also a question of how to improve the way of uh, in the confidence of, on the model like, to make it very robust. And I touch also on this, the generation of, and the data. This was trained with a very large data set of DNS. Ingesting that data and processing the data is actually quite expensive. It takes a lot of time. Uh, there's a bottleneck just in the input output of the data. Uh, and that in a way that there's some data science tools that they have to come into play here to accelerate this process. And uh, I, I have used this uh, a neural network to, for the model. Um, and then that, that's very convenient. I mentioned these neural networks are very good tool for classifying things, uh, the pictures that we know that they do very well and also very good at doing some nonlinear regression of the data, making some nonlinear combination of different elements and making a prediction. But then it's also bringing a few caveats, like for example, 
what type of architecture should I use? What is the reliability? How do I interpret that? So in this case, I try to reduce the problem of interp interpretability by really specializing a lot what each neural network is doing. So I can understand what my model is doing in general, is classifying the flow and how that's do happening. And then it's doing some nonlinear interpolation to make a prediction. But still there is this problem of inside that particular classifier, how are things wor uh, working and how can I understand that it's not gonna do something of limits that I, I don't want it to happen. So that's also a very understanding problem. And with that, uh, I think that I, I finished with this, go back to my previous slide uh, with the problems that I was interested in and the one of the commercial aircraft that I thought that that, that was probably interesting for this audience. And I also hope that it was interesting the talk. Um, and I'll be happy now to answer any questions that, that you might have. So, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Adrian. It was really amazing <laughs> presentation with a lot of, it really clear and full of really nice visualizations. So I, I, I personally really appreciated that. And uh, I have a question, but I would like to first give the, the audience the possibility to ask uh, questions if any. So I, I remind you, if you have any question, you can just switch on your microphone or raise your hand or write in the chat. So, is there any question? Not yet. Maybe I can start with one. So. I'm quite impressed about, yeah, you mentioned this about the training data set is quite large uh, amount of data. So even accessing the data is, is indeed challenging. Uh, I was wondering if uh, like, um, uh, you said you use the DNS, so quite high resolved time, space time resolved with DNS. Uh, if you maybe have considered like using even DNS or let's say resolved, but uh, say, um, I mean, you said at the end of the talk that it is not clear which building blocks we should use, but I have expected maybe using like building blocks also, I don't know, boundary layer with, I mean, you know, you have the flat plate, uh, I don't know, something, even a, fl um, a flow over a, a foil, an a fall, maybe with a low, lower Reynolds number or something, something more similar to the real setup but less complex, I would say. I don't know if this kind of uh, way of thinking can help or not. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a good point. And actually when deciding the building blocks, I also consider if I should use, and you mentioned maybe an airfoil yeah. in a way, <laughs> like the airfoil will fit more natural here because then the flow should, it has to resemble over and over. Yeah. Forth. But uh, the, the, I avoided that in, in the sense that I was also uh, trying to avoid biasing the model to know a lot about some type of geometry. So I was trying to run as far away as possible from a specific geometry. Because if I train it from an airfoil and it works for an airfoil, then it doesn't mean that I was able to understand the fundamental physics that are happening in the airfoil. Yeah, it means that the case is similar. Uh, I could train it using data from an aircraft. I have experiments and I can train my model until it matches the experiments. But then I think that I will be missing the, this part of, I'm capturing the key essence of what is there. Okay. That's why I decided to, as a first try, go with these uh, building blocks uh, okay. and see what happens. Because if these building blocks, they work for an aircraft, probably they are also gonna work for the drone and they are also gonna work for geophysical flows. I don't know, like, because this, they are not biased. If I train my model with an airfoil, is it gonna work in geophysical flows? I don't know. So that's why I, I, but your point is actually good. It might be that if you want to make very good predictions in some cases, you really need to introduce some information about that geometry in a way. So that might happen eventually. So, yeah. Just a really quick question, uh, because I can see there's a couple of them in the chat. Uh, maybe you mentioned my miss the, the, the DNS that you use for training, uh, which which Reynolds number you use? I mean, I suppose high Reynolds number for the DNS or middle one. I don't know, just to have a rough yeah, idea. Yeah, so if I yeah come back here, I didn't mention that too much. Uh, so for the, the the highest Reynolds numbers that I'm using are for the the channel flow uh, that I have time resolved data is uh, if I use the friction Reynolds number is of the order yeah. of four thousand. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, for, uh, okay, yes, Reynolds course, under yeah. 4,000. Okay. Uh, it's, it's reasonable, it's still low. You yeah. would expect that in an aircraft, uh, the Reynolds friction Reynolds number is could be uh, 20, 30,000. Yeah. 40,000. So it's still one order of magnitude below what I would like to predict. Uh, but because these are large scales, in a way, it's yeah, yeah. Quite reasonable. Yeah, I know. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, is there any physical world model that can provide similar accuracy as the self critical neural network model by Xi Qing? Xi Qing? So right now I compare with the equilibrium world model is the other comparison that I have shown. And in that case, this uh, model, the self-critical model is doing better. Uh, I know that there are other models also using neural networks and there are also the so-called non-equilibrium world models. I, I didn't compare with those. I will need to do this in a more systematic way to be able to answer that. Uh, but what to me feels like that just yes, for my experience in previous uh, world models, is like if you fix the cost, if you fix the computational cost, this model probably is going to do better or the same. That's, that's what, what, what I think. Now, if you don't care about computational cost, you can always refine your grid. And if you refine enough, probably any of the mo world models that we have right now, they will make up very good prediction. Even you can go to 3% error. The problem is that then you don't need one day to run the case. You need maybe one month because the grid is so large. So that kind of uh, defeating the purpose, but uh, I am hoping to make a more systematic analysis of cost versus accuracy for different type of models. Yeah, good question. And there's also another question by Thomas saying that uh, why was a free unconstrained, let's say unconstrained uh, flow not used as a building block? Uh, if I interpret well, uh, a free, uh, maybe you mean a free flow. Free flow, yeah. Uh, ah. Yeah, like a free stream. So uh, it was actually used. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, there are a few things that I didn't mention here. There is a. I have a, a publication. It's in the CTR annual research briefs where I describe in a lot of detail uh, how are this how is this model done and trained, and that's one of the cases. And I use it mostly to detect that my first my grid is not even within the tool and boundary layer. So I, I use a free flow to detect that my resolution is not enough. That's actually how I can tell that in a leading edge of a wind, I'm a, essentially I'm in the, in the free stream and my model is detecting that. Uh, I didn't mention that here because that's, it's not like there are any physics in that flow. In that flow, it's just a case that is so obvious that if you are in a free stream, then you are missing the two boundary layer. Uh, that's something that you should know. Uh, so I use that in, in, in that sense, yes. I also use, some constraints to for Galilean invariance and uh, invariance and then translations and rotations of the, all these building blocks that I didn't mention that this was important. Yeah, but good point. Thank you. There's still another question by Subhakti saying that um, you you are considering a perfectly neutral flow, especially in the case of channel flow. Would it make sense to use a model which incorporates buoyancy, like including a component or rather than a convection turbulence? Yeah, it would make sense uh, depending on your application. I knew that my application that I wanted to test this model for the first time, because this is the first time I tested this model, was uh, an, an aircraft in landing. I know the flow, the, the buoyancy doesn't play any role and is low Mach number. And in a way that it set the type of building blocks that I'm looking for. If I want to apply this to the, let's say the at atmospheric boundary layer and to make some prediction along the day, so I know that there's gonna be some thermal inversion and that that's gonna drive the, the, the turbulence and the flow, then it will definitely make sense to add an extra building block that takes that into account. But I think that what is also nice of this model is that is, as you see, somehow scalable. So I can use only one model. The structure of the model is always the same. If I think that I'm missing some physics, I look for the building block that contains those physics and I add it to my collection. And then I apply it to the case that I want to. So the answer is yes, it would make a lot of sense if I think that th those physics are relevant for my problem. Of course, it depends on the application. Um, exactly. There's one question from Vishal. He writes his hand. Uh, hello, Dr. Duran. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you. It was a beautiful presentation. Um, uh, my question, actually I have two questions. 
Um, so first one is regarding the data set. So are you considering the unsteady effects of all these data set sets? Or is it like you have taken the data sets, you're building blocks from a stationary, um, like stat uh, statistically stationary point on? Yeah, so in this case, uh, I am not considering any unsteadiness, statistically speaking. Obviously, these flows are unsteady it's and the way yeah. the data that I use is instantaneous data mm -hmm. that somehow has that information that the flow is not steady instantaneously, but statistically I'm considering that all these building blocks are steady. Uh, uh, I consider originally to have some cases where I introduce a transient. I, I've been working on a channel flow where I introduce a suddenly a lateral force to change the direction very fast of the channel. Mm -hmm. And I was considering using that as a way of capturing uh, this uh, strongly unsteadiness. Mm -hmm. But uh, as, as a first try, I decided not to do that. It, the data set was already quite big, uh, so I decided to stick to this. But it might be important, and it might be that some of the, the deficiencies that I see, uh, they might be related to that. And I could also think of cases where actually, if I don't have that effect, my model won't be able to, to make a good prediction. Yeah, the, uh, the question was uh, designed um, basically with the point that uh, the aerodynamic uh, cases are like at high angles of attack, they develop a lot of unsteadiness. But yeah. uh, data, data set for training is not having. A other question is regarding the transition. So um, even if it's very high angle of attack, uh, I don't know how um, like important the transition perspective is, but um, it, it isn't there a necessity to involve that as one of your building blocks? Yeah, that's actually a good point. And also just, just to touch in the previous point, in this, in this separation bubble, the DNS data is unsteady, the separation bubble. So mm -hmm. you can actually see some unsteadiness mm -hmm. and it's somehow containing the model. And now about the transition, uh, I, yeah, it's again, uh, is it the transition relevant in this case? The answer in this case is no. And that's because you have a swept wind. When you have a sweep in the wind, even it's not even in the landing, but when you have a sweep on the wind, you have a cross flow instability. Uh, it's very fast and very unstable. So the flow is transitioning immediately, immediately. Uh, and I knew that in a case. So I knew enough about the case to, to be aware that I, uh, the modeling, I could include a transition case and, and that could play a role. But in this case, I knew that I didn't need it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yeah, I can go back to this idea of imagine that you have, a, there are designs of the winds that they, these winds that they are designed to sustain a laminar flow for a 20% of the, of the core of the wind. Yeah. That definitely, this model wouldn't work. It would in a way tell you, I don't understand what is this flow and it would make a bad prediction. And there you really need some building block that contains the transition with the type of instability that is happening there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think we have just time for still a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one, I think you already mentioned it during during your your presentation, but uh, Yuzong asking uh, that you shown the CL versus angle of attack between simulation and experiment, but the figure only showed the comparison for one angle of attack. Uh, have you tried to uh, the comparison of some other angles angles of attack? Uh, yeah, I mentioned that. I, I, I apologize for that because I didn't have time yeah. to update the figure. So I have done almost all the range of angles of attack and the predictions are also good. Uh, the only difference is that when you are you go to low angle of attack, even the, the classical model is also doing it well because it works well there too. So, but the, the, if, if I go to the, yeah, I, I, this was actually my bad that uh, I didn't update the plot. Uh, but yeah, I, I have all, all, all the way of this uh, lift. And this, the, the close symbol will more or less follow the line. And the open symbol is very off here, but then it's also getting closer. So by the end, you are below 10 or five, then both predictions, the classic and the self-critical model, they almost match. And that's probably because the classical model is just based for attach flow and the flow below 10, five degrees is completely attached. So it already works fine. And the difficulties in the classic model is when you have a very highly detached flow at a high angle of attack. But uh, yeah. Okay, good. And one last question from Daniel saying that your model works well in predicting lift, 
Uh, do you know how well it works in predicting local quantities? For example, uh, local quantity you could presumably compare in your simulation and experiments would be the location where the flow separates. So yeah, yeah that's, the question is, do you know do you know how you are predicting local quantities? Yeah, so I, that's that's actually very good and very important because you what you don't want is that there is an error cancellation in some parts of the wind and the aircraft, and then suddenly you get the, the right answer for the wrong reasons. Uh, so that's actually what Daniel said. It's very important to make this point-wise. For the point-wise, uh, unfortunately, these experiments are kind of difficult. So I don't have point-wise measurements of, for example, mean velocity profiles in this aircraft. However, NASA, they have other experiments that are not this commercial aircraft. There's another experiment called the NASA Juncture Flow. It is a body that looks like an aircraft, but it's a simplified version of that. And there they have mean velocity profiles. And there I compare the mean velocity profiles. And if you go to, to my, the, the, my proceeding on this publication, that is the, the, in the, you look for the CTR, Stanford Annual Brief. Uh, this was uh, 2020 and it's called like this, like set critical machine learning model. There I compare the mean velocity profiles. And there I show that with this model, you are improving the predictions compared to what you will get using just the classic model. So yeah, very, very important actually. Thank you very much. Oh, just one last question, just very quickly. Uh, you, you said that, uh, you, I mean, you focus only on lift, but have you just tried uh, computing drag or, or yes. not? Yes, I computed the drag. The, is there, there is any a catch. difficulty? Yeah, is any difficulty a, compared to lift? A, it's much more difficult the drag. Yeah, okay. And, <laughs> <laughs> much more difficult and the reason why I didn't show that here is because uh, there is some a small controversy about the experiments uh, oh, because okay. many people do using many different tools nobody has okay. been able to exactly match the experiment so there is some concerns that maybe the experiment they have some uncertainty there that wasn't quantified well okay. uh, so it's not so conclusive uh, but they have okay. a new set of experiments that I'm hoping to apply this. It's also full aircraft. It's, yep. they, they have redone the experiment. Now, hopefully, it's going to be better. So I'm going to make also predictions of the, of the drug. It's much more difficult, actually, much more challenging. Perfect. Thank you very much again. So yeah, thanks a lot. I would like to thank uh, on the behalf of all the organizers to having uh, Adrian Lozano Duran for this really terrific presentation. And so, I will invite you to, to, to attend next week uh, talk. Again, uh, will be next Wednesday. And so we thank again, Adrian, and thank you all for, for attending this, this uh, today's presentation. And see you soon, hopefully. Have a good rest of your day.